South Park has taken aim at the Walt Disney Company many times in the past, but this time it's different. South Park the Pandering, a special event, which will be coming out on Paramount Plus just before Halloween, looks to take down the House of Mouse. Why should Disney be worried though? What if I told you that South Park the Pandering, which is going to mock, no doubt, the Marvels, Star Wars, and so much more, is eight times more popular and eight times more searched for than the next big thing out of Disney. You won't believe it, but we've got the receipts right now. Oh, hamburgers. I'll tell you which one. It's too dang hot. It's too dang hot. All right, folks, we're here to tell you that the Walt Disney Company is probably not looking forward to South Park the Pandering. And wait until you find out why. It's going to take a while to get all the way to the end of this thing to explain just how big it is. But needless to say, folks, that uh, when it comes to South Park and Disney, we are finding out that South Park actually has the viewers and Disney does not. And that's really not good for Disney when it uh, looks like South Park is going to be taking aim directly at them. For reasons we'll explain in just a moment. But joining us for this uh, endeavoring into finding out just how bad it is for the mouse Lorena Creole of the Lorena Creole YouTube channel, Valiant Renegade of the same name YouTube channel, and Tommy Tables, also known as that table guy who is doing so many fabulous interviews for my member exclusive videos. Welcome to you all. Thank you. Good to be here. All right. Well, let's dive straight in. And uh, yeah, this is it right here out of SK Pop by Tanya Tawari, upcoming South Park episode mocks Disney and Snow White actor Rachel Zegler in the most brutal of ways, but hang in there. And uh, by the way, you can see they've swapped out for Cartman, but just just hang tight. This is going to uh, be far broader, I think, than mm. just Rachel Zegler. The American animated series South Park is known for its irreverent humor and biting social commentary in one of its special episodes set to be aired on October 27th. The series has targeted the contentious issue of diversity in Disney, I mean Disney live action remakes. The episode in question takes a direct jab at Rachel Zegler, the actor cast as Snow White in a live action remake of the 1937 animated classic. Goes on to talk about those uh, movies, but it says here the upcoming episode of South Park censures the broader Disney strategy of pandering to diversity. While the episode will also touch upon other Hollywood studios that support gender swapping and race swapping, the mockery is mainly aimed at Disney. You can see the new version of Butters there uh, with an interesting haircut. <laughs> oh, hamburgers. Oh, oh, hamburgers. Oh, my gosh. Um, but here's what I want to bring up, and we're showing this on the screen right now, folks. Take a look at this character that uh, is shockingly similar to Sabine. Now, our panelists can't see that right now, we're, but we've got this up on the screen for our audience to see. Uh, this character who looks very much like Sabine from Star Wars I'm starting to think that this is going to be a complete and utter attack on Disney itself and what they have had, the mantle strategy. Now, we know the mantle strategy comes from Victoria Alonzo, but it seems to have metastasized all throughout the mouse, and they were using this everywhere. So you don't just have Thor, you have Lady Thor. You don't just have Hulk, you have She-Hulk. You don't just have Loki, you have Girl Loki. And it goes on and on. You don't have Luke Skywalker replaced by Rey. How do you make Rey be more popular? Well, you make Luke Skywalker into a total uh, joke. Uh, uh, suckling the blue milk out of or green milk out of the teats of an alien. You were so, wrong when you said jerk. That was a Freudian slip. So. And it was, it was. Well, I almost slipped even worse than that. But Disney is slipping. Let's go to the panel real quick. Uh, I want to find out from you guys how badly do you think that this could uh, damage Disney, considering the Marvels is likely to be the last Marvel movie all the way until late 2024, mm -hmm. based on the most recent news we have out of the Hollywood strikes panel, take it away. I, I mean, look, I, I'm, I've been saying this for a while in terms of uh, Marvel uh, and, and, and their uh, phase four and five. I covered this in a video a few days ago uh, and people gave me so much flack for this. This was back in 2021, nearly two years ago. Now it was not long before Shang-Chi came out. And I said, uh, I proclaimed that Kevin Feige had, killed the MCU because he led into the MCU phases four and five, the post in game era of Marvel with saying how much more diverse and inclusive and all this kind of stuff. And it's like, Oh, geez. And Pete's okay. That's it. You're going to kill the franchise because you're going to try to take it into a direction that fans are not looking for. You're not going to give 
the largesse of fandom what they want. You're going to give them what you think they need, right? That's your mantra. It's not going to work. Lo and behold, here we are two years later, and the MCU is is now officially a failed enterprise, in my opinion. Uh, and that is based on what they spend to produce this versus the returns they're getting back. There's no denying that this is a massive failure on Disney's part. They have blown billions of dollars of stockholder capital continuing down this road. Um, if Captain Marvel uh, and the Marvels are their last hoorah before they take a, an extended hiatus, um, <laughs> have fun with that. Uh, I, I don't think Deadpool is going to bring fans back, if anything, more than temporarily but it's not going to continue on to things like Captain Falcon and Brave New World Order and and so on and so forth. By the time they get to Fantastic Four and the X-Men, nobody cares anymore. There's no audience to get excited to go into those movies because they have not been led into with quality product. It's done. So Absolutely. And uh, let's take a look here. We know that South Park has taken on a great number of topics and really taking them down. I mean, you can think about Mr. Jefferson, who is, uh, of course, Michael Jackson. You can think about the uh, way that they have dealt with Tom Cruise and so many others, uh, sometimes not well received. This is out of Watch Mojo, and you can see uh, the, the Mickey <laughs> icon over there with uh, Xi Jinping <laughs> on the shirt. Park, Mickey. Oh, no. That's man. right. I love him. <laughs> Top 10 times South Park made fun of Disney. Now, I just want to run through these to show you. I think this is really, you know, South Park does something that when we talk about things, we have a particular reach. And let's, so let, let's say that on sometimes we hit uh, 100,000 or more views on a video. South Park is reaching millions and millions, and they do so in a way that is far more graphic and, frankly, uh, eye-catching than we possibly could do on this platform. But uh, let's take a look at this list. I'm going to tell you there's one that's missing here that I think deserves to be on the list. They've got uh, number 10, Streaming Addiction, which went after Disney+, Plus, even featured a Baby Yoda character, They've got Mickey Mistreatment, which is where uh, Mickey Mouse is not acting very nicely in China. Uh, we've got something from uh, the uh, both the video game, Black Panther. We've got uh, where they took on The Force Awakens, making fun of it. They've got uh, the, the Facebook thing, not so much. <laughs> the, jo the Jonas Brothers one was yes, the these are the Yes, ones. yes. So, and the so boat the Jonas ride. Brothers one. And then finally, of course... <laughs> Uh, Randy Marsh confronts Winnie the Pooh. I think, I mean, that that yeah. did such damage to Disney. But here's one uh, that's not on here, and I want to hear, Lorena, what you think about this. Um, at the time, Disney not, did not own Indiana Jones, the Dial of Destiny, or Indiana Jones, the franchise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They do now. Do you remember the episode where uh, yes. they said, <laughs> yes, where the boys are traumatized by uh -huh. seeing what uh, <laughs> is happening to Indy? When, Lorena, when, okay, you've got Lorena. to see the episode sometime. Lorena, when Indiana, when, when they said Indiana Jones got uh, rhymes with grape uh, by Spielberg and Lucas, and the whole and that was for that was, was for the uh, the fourth one. No, I mean yeah, the fourth movie. So, that was for uh, Crystal Skull. Crystal Skull. Yeah. Oh. In, yeah. yeah, it was like Deliverance. Uh, so <laughs> I, I worry that <laughs> Disney is about to be on the receiving end again. Folks, if you've been watching uh, up until now, we're about to show you why I think Disney should be scared. So let's not hold this any longer. Here is why, uh, and we'll have to make it so none of us appear for a moment. Here is a Google Trends chart, folks. This is measuring the number of people who are searching for a given item. And we are pulling this from the last 30 days. Of course, South Park, the pandering, has only been known about for about that amount of time. And so take a look at this. South Park is very often, I mean, I mean, oh my gosh, in terms of comparisons, 84% to 10%. Wow. Uh, Whoa. So <laughs> more, than, more than eight times the interest in South Park the Pandering versus the Marvels. Now, we're getting closer to the Marvels and South Park the Pandering. South Park is still pulling double, double what the Marvels is doing. We know the we know the Marvels is not going to perform well at the box office. Tommy, uh, how concerned should Disney be at this point that they're about to be taken down in a very visible way? Oh, I mean, very concerned. It reminds me of that meme of the, the little dog sitting in the burning house saying, "This is fine, right?" Like at this point, what can they do? 
Um, but you know, what I find really interesting about the question you had asked originally, I don't, uh, why did they decide that? Like, why, the, why did the author of that article decide that the, the pandering was targeting Rachel Zegler and Snow White of all things? Like, I you know mean, what, Tommy? I, I think I think it's the. I don't want to be mean to the author. Let's 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 delocalize it for a moment, so we're not making fun of that particular author. Right. I think some. Of, I think some of these writers are so uh, disconnected from what average folks think and and what the kind of stuff we're talking about every day. They live in a bubble, and so they're just trying to understand what South Park is making fun of, and they're like, oh. I bet it's Rachel Zegler. That's what they're making fun of. That, that's my best guess about what's happening in the article. That's depressing. But I mean, <laughs> like, I, I, think, I think it's not just Disney. I think it's sort of a bit of a condemnation of the entire entertainment industry. Like, I mean, Disney certainly is at the forefront of, you know, the stuff that they're talking about. And that's obvious. Well, they might be talking about it in that TV show. We haven't seen it yet. But Netflix is right there with them. Uh, like All the comic book industry is right there with them. Like, everything is there. So it, you know, I think when you get made fun of by South Park, when they finally sort of unleash both barrels on you, that's kind of a sign that you're, whatever it is, is, is sort of, the pendulum is swifting, like shifting back. Um, the momentum is stalling out. Like when, when South Park takes a crack at you, it's hit mainstream consciousness. And once it's hit mainstream consciousness and awareness, um, it's not going to last for much longer, I don't think. You know, I, I think it's going to crystallize what we've been saying, and we haven't seen the the uh, special event, so clearly we don't know for sure. But I do think it's going to present what we've been saying and what so many who follow Disney know, but those who don't won't know it until South Park does this. That said, the interest levels for South Park: The Pandering are, I mean, they are off the charts for a special event on Paramount. I'm amazed too. I mean, Paramount must be loving this. But here's where I would like to uh, wrap up our conversation about South Park before we take some questions from members. And that is, mm -hmm. when you think about the takedowns they've done, these are often like single episode takedowns. They are essentially setting up a full-on South Park barrage against Disney in an entire mini-series, right? This is a special event movie that I'm sure they can break down into episodes in the future. Mm -hmm. All dedicated to characters that are doing what Disney does. To say it again, because the author, like you said, Tommy Tables, is comparing this or, or deciding that this is about Rachel Ziegler. There's literally a character that looks exactly like Sabine playing Kenny. Good Lord. <laughs> I mean, they are coming for you, Disney, in a full movie. So this could be this could be far worse than what they did to John Travolta, Tom Cruise, etc., uh, Barbara Streisand. I mean, my gosh, didn't, isn't South Park responsible for the Barbara Streisand effect? I think. Yes. Yes. So. Second In one episode. of the most, yeah, the second episode, Mecca Barbara. Yep. <laughs> Mecca Streisand. That's Mecca what it was. Mecca Streisand. Yep. That was this it. Could be, uh. we, we could invent the Disney effect here. Wow. So, uh, final thoughts on this on South Park, the pandering, and then we'll take the questions from members, guys. If you think what South Park has done in separate episodes when it comes to Disney or something, the pandering is going to be all of that uh, on steroids. And frankly, I cannot wait to see it. I hope the, I hope the spirit or the zombie of Winnie the Pooh comes back to strike. <laughs> I, I really hope. <laughs> I, and you know, chances we're going to see Ray and the Mandalorian, I think very high. Very, very high. Perhaps we'll all get revenge for what they've done to Star Wars with this. All right, well, let's go to uh, some questions from members of the channel who send in uh, cues from you. That's what we call it. Space Dave 2000 says, it seems they finally opened the Moana water attraction at Epcot. Amazing. I mean, amazing. What more can be said for five long years of hard work and hundreds of millions of dollars? Man, am I crying. It's so exciting. That's not a cue from you, but Lorena. What have you uh, What have you thought about the Moana walkthrough attraction? Um, I haven't seen it yet. Uh, there's been other things at the park that <laughs> that I've wanted to uh, that I've wanted to see. Um, I'm not really all that interested in uh, in seeing it. I really don't hear a lot of buzz about it uh, at the park. So. Uh, 
it'll be interesting to see if there are any lines when I go there uh, next Saturday. Well, it's, well, I'll tell you how this works. Uh, and this is, uh, this is advantageous to Disney. And it's advantageous to the vloggers and the bloggers who want access to Disney. And so they promote it. Or those who are just, who, why would you be ideologically or cultishly uh, connected to Disney? I don't know. But th what they do, Lorena, is, of course, they set up these virtual queues. But mm -hmm. there's not enough demand to sustain the attraction for the rest of the day, for the whole day. So those things are done by like 2 p.m. or 3 p.m. So they close the attraction. So it's artificially scarce, right? So you, you've only got a limited amount of time, and it's only through the virtual queue. And so what that does is at the beginning of the park, the beginning of the day, it creates these long lines. And so then everybody takes pictures of the long lines and like, oh my gosh, this, the, 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 you know, the, the critics are so wrong. This thing's so popular. And then you actually go about, I don't know, two o'clock, three o'clock, and you say, um, it's empty. I'm, I'm confused now. But that's, that's the way they make it happen. There you go. <laughs> my thought exactly. <laughs> Julio, Romero, Julio Romero says, if course correction started today, do you think Disney would even stand a chance versus Universal in the next few years? Valiant, take that one away. Uh, first of all, Valiant, how long would it take for Disney to course correct if they started right now? Uh, well, to be fair, I mean, it really depends on what we consider a course correction, right? What is the scope of that course correction? That's a video in and of itself. But if Disney were to turn around tomorrow and retract all of this, you know, this craziness that they've engaged in with the DEI and ESG and all this other stuff where they're changing characters around. I did a video this morning on this uh, that I released this afternoon talking about <clears throat> their new uh, 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 chief diversity officer that they hired. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and it's like, look, you've got tons. Disney is a very naturally diverse company. They've had amazing diverse characters for decades, yeah. starting with things like Jasmine. And then, as I said in the video, my favorite Disney princess, Tiana, because, hey, I'm not jaded or anything being from New Orleans, but yeah, there you go. I'm like, you've had that. You've had Moana. You've had Mulan. You've had Pocahontas. But they haven't, they haven't guided in towards those characters much so far. They want to take the Cinderella's and they want to take the Snow Whites and the Ariels and radically alter them. It's like, that doesn't work. That's not going to work. You can't give commercially your audience any indication to where they stop and question what they're seeing on the screen. If you've got a multi-billion dollar selling character, leave it the hell alone. It's selling multi-billion dollars worth of stuff. Don't do anything to make the audience go, wait, what? That's that's the worst thing you can do as a company from a marketing perspective. Um, if Disney were to hard course correct tomorrow and 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 publicly announce they're getting away from all that silliness, right? We'll either, you know, we can serve diverse audiences around the globe by making quality stories and quality characters for them. Great, awesome, do that. I, I don't see that happening, but could they catch up to Universal if they did that all of that tomorrow? It would be they'd be really hard pressed to be able to pull that off, honestly. Um, can Disney still climb out of the hole they've dug themselves in? Sure, it's not going to be easy. You know, it 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 takes years to build trust with an audience. It takes seconds to kill it. Uh, so, I mean, Disney is going to have to really work very hard over time with rebuilding the trust of primarily, let's be honest, the American family audience. That's the most important thing to them from a financial perspective. That's what they have lost more than anything else. I think we'll find out how much damage has been done based on how Wish performs this holiday season. Mm. So I think that's a good barometer for us. Valiant, did you did you uh, when you when you did your video by any chance did you notice that this new CDO, this new chief diversity officer, that she was featured in an executive order by the current administration, one of her programs? Uh, not specifically as an executive order. We covered some of her history as in you know where she worked for the Department of Commerce as a CDO, which I kind of quipped like, why does the department of commerce in the U.S. government need 
a chief diversity officer? Like, why do any of these departments need these things? Uh, you know, why does the small business administration that you used to work for need a chief diversity officer? Like, what is the purpose of this? Uh, like, we're making jobs for people that have educational backgrounds that serve no otherwise economic purpose to society, <laughs> but we're just going to well, make I'll jobs for you. them. She, uh, she had a, a program that she created that uh, mm -hmm. was then put forth into policy at the federal level through an executive order by the current administration. Then she goes into the highest levels of corporate uh, C-suites. Mm -hmm. Don't, don't think for a second that isn't, uh, well, there's not connections oh, being made, uh, continuing to be made at the Walt Disney company with particular political parties. It just I, keeps I agree. going and going. Yep. No, I mean, that was one of the jokes in the video was, of course she worked for the government. Yep. Ha, ha, ha. Of course. I mean, that was, that was, <laughs> that was kind of the bit as far as to the specificity of her getting a, you know, a, a presidential accolade from a uh, president dementia. Um, you know, <laughs> look, I, I didn't know about that one. But it doesn't surprise me one bit. Well, that th what what that did, of course, when she when her uh, when her initiative was turned into an executive order, was that gave her the gravitas then to be brought in because she didn't have the gravitas prior to that. But mm -hmm. then she had the sort of acumen, the sort of resume that would allow her to be at the head of the Walt Disney Company. And of course, then you get uh, the ideal the ideologies of a particular viewpoint flowing only from that viewpoint into the company. It just continues on. She's been there for a year, basically. Yep. And and of course, I think she was being groomed for that position, for, you know, since probably since she's been there, uh, and especially since uh, LaTondra Newton departed back in, in June of this year. Um, I think she was always on the radar, and it was just a matter of, you know, when they made Sonia Coleman head over that department, and move that department under HR, which Sonia Coleman runs. It was a matter of time before this 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 new chief diversity officer was brought into the fray. That's right. I do find it interesting, and I have to I have to you know kudos to my uh, channel fans out there for noticing the fact that uh, one of the things that seems most distressing is that the Walt Disney Company went ahead and publicly named a new chief diversity officer before they have permanently installed a new CFO. <laughs> that it's like what's more shows important? their priorities, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, doesn't it really? It's like uh, you'd think you'd want to have a CFO going. You just filed a major report with the SEC. You're about to go into probably the most significant earnings call you've ever had in the last right. 20 years. Um, but no, we want to let you know who the new CDO is. What about your chief financial officer? Me. So funny. They're sinking faster than a submarine. The, the company is, all, you know, is crazier than uh, Britney Spears at a barbershop. But and yet, at the same time, they won't get they won't get somebody to come in and run their finances. I thought you were about to make a I get that submarine reference. joke with screen doors. I would never do that. I would never. But uh, there you go, folks. You come in for a South Park uh, uh, video, and you come away understanding at high level what's going on with Disney and their CDO. And but at sweet. least we're giving them South Park jokes as we go. Yeah, that's, that's right. Cool. All right, from Cousin Dwight. Uh oh now we're in the office territory. What would the cost be for studios to redistrib redistribute pop culture classics like Top Gun, Star Wars, Raiders of the Lost Ark E.T. next summer? And again, talking about the fact that, well, it doesn't look like we're going to have much for the summer. Uh, very little cost associated with that. Only benefit, I would say. Wouldn't you think uh, so valiant, especially as these uh, screens are going to be empty otherwise? Uh, I, 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 it's no cost really. I mean, th when theaters love to book these catalog titles or these library titles from studios because they get to put them in theaters if they're big hits. Uh, I mean, in that case, the theaters are generally keeping 70 to 75% of the revenue that they generate from ticket sales for these things because they're just catalog titles. Uh, studios, it's basically, it doesn't cost them anything. They're already on the books. They've already been, for the most part, fully depreciated. Studios don't have to spend a dime to market these things. This is all on the theater, and they're just paying the studios back a piece of the gate. Uh, it's a win-win for everybody. Absolutely, especially when there's nothing else going to be there. Lorena, if you had to pick a classic that you wanted to see on the big screen this, uh, this coming summer, considering they're moving out Deadpool and all the other stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, what classic uh, film would you like to see back on the silver screen? 
I would say aliens with an S. Ooh. Ooh. Very, Not, very cool yeah. choice. Still waiting for not 3D. a K release, James Cameron. Still waiting. Yeah, <laughs> bring it. <laughs> I know. I know. Valiant's not a 3D guy. Are you a 3D person, Lorena? Um, not, not really. Uh, unless it's something like Super Mario Brothers. Yeah, I paid for the 3D upgrade because when I the saw upgrade. the trailer in 3D. It was like being in the video game That's itself, right. like nice. really in the game. So, yeah, I, I paid for that. Tommy, what about you? What would you like to see on the big screen for 2024? What classic film? Well, you know, I'm going to go for the Dark Horse choice here. Um, I'm going to say Waterworld. I think it's time for redemption. <laughs> Kevin, Kevin Costner's never been hotter. Wow. <laughs> I thought you were about to say Black Hole based on, on that. It wasn't <laughs> as terrible as people said it was. I, I mean, it was a fun movie. It, it wasn't was, great, but... It was it, I admit, I like it. Point. I It's like a comforting movie I like to go and rewatch sometimes. It's okay. Your well, pleasure. <sighs> Here's another question for us. Jason Barnes asks, does the trend away from physical media concern you? It seems every streaming service continues to raise prices, continue, continues to increase advertising and have the power to pull content off the service whenever they want. Before too long, they could just become worse than cable. I've stockpiled Blu-ray and DVD because I didn't want to get trapped into needing a subscription just to watch one movie. Well, Jason, nobody on this panel cares a thing about physical media. And none. Uh, nobody none. on here is part of any yeah, kind of okay. show that covers that. None, none of us does a <laughs> weekly show on physical yeah. media at all. Um, <laughs> yes, I think I think physical media and the ability to have something is vital. I think you have to own something uh, to preserve it because clearly these companies will go in and reconfigure it and censor it and all those things or put some sort of uh, you know, uh, uh, verbiage in front of it that says, hey, mm -hmm. this was terrible when it came out and it's terrible today. Why are you such a terrible person for watching it? Modern audiences oh. should be warned as this was <laughs> shot during a different era when <sighs> society was, I'm like, that's the most offensively stupid oh, thing on I earth. You were about to watch our vile content. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, yes. oh God. I, I mean, I, I've got over were vile. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a thousand titles on physical media. Uh, it, it's somewhere around there. Um, look, uh, absolutely uh, <laughs> get physical media. I still have, I was joking the other night. I moved it. Oh, wait, it's over here. I mean, I still buy physical media of audio CDs. So, wow. I mean, it's like, I, I just, because they still, I, make, they still make music CDs. Yes, they still make vinyl too. Um, I know about I vinyl. Yeah, I don't buy the modern vinyl because it's pointless. It was recorded digitally, so there's no right. point in putting it onto an analog medium. Um, but I mean, I still buy physical copies of CDs, just like I still buy physical copies of movies in 4K when they're restored correctly. I mean, I just buy the eight tracks. That's all I'm into. Oh, <laughs> oh wow! I'm so, well. You know what? That's the only good way, pro anymore, to keep your Lawrence Welk collection up to date <laughs> uh, that and liberace i'm sure you have tons of that stuff <laughs> that's right absolutely track. yeah but i mean i will say like even when it comes to video games it makes economical sense to buy things like to buy the physical media as opposed to just downloading the game right like i went to go I buy my um, physical video games too yeah. yeah like i went to go get the new super mario wonder game and i was yeah so there you go and i was able to trade in uh another game that i had uh, had i downloaded it you know, I would have been out of pocket an extra 40 bucks. Like it just physical media. I think it just makes sense. And I don't, I, I hope it's not going to go anywhere. I mean, that news about Best Buy was really kind of distressing, but I'm sure other retailers will pick up the, the void that they leave. Walmart. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> All right. From Vixeris. So they opened a Moana on the 100 rather than having any special show or merch in Orlando. Yet Paris and Tokyo get unique fare and show. Will even pelts be able to push actual value back to Walt Disney World itself? Universal can't give the rat that humble pie soon enough. Lorena, this was something I actually found very interesting. I didn't talk about it. I didn't make a, w a video about it. But uh, yeah, Disneyland Paris had basically every character that they had in their in their costume department come out and go through Main Street. It was amazing. I mean, you're talking about oh. tons and tons. and tons. I don't know how they had enough cast members to do it. And they were all doing the correct motions as if they'd been trained to be these characters. It was incredible. And yeah, uh, they opened a walkthrough attraction at Epcot. That was what Walt Disney World did. So 
Uh, Lorena, what do you think? Will we ever see value coming back to Walt Disney World in the next, I don't know, five, six, seven years? I really don't see it with the pricing structure that they that they have now with the Genie Plus and the Lightning Lane that you have to pay for. With the markup, not have to, but pretty much if you want to get certain things, uh, certain things done. With the markups in the merchandise, in, you know, the food that's there, all of that, the hotels, just the amount of money that they've marked things up by, it's if they do start to bring value back, it's going to take quite a long time. I mean, there's this fanfare about the Disney dining plan, which used to be a pretty good, uh, pretty good value. Now it's coming back and it's not as good as it used to, uh, as it used to be. So I cannot say right now, given the state of Disney World, given the state of how much things cost. I mean, I was just there today just looking at the cost of items, of merchandise, and it's not going to happen any anytime soon. Right, Disney right now doesn't have the external, I would say, external forces acting on it to course correct. With the pricing, you probably will not see the pricing really start to even out or go back in the direction it should be when Epic Universe opens. That's a great point. And I'll say too, you know, there's there's so much that's missing from the parks today versus just in years past. I mean, you think about it, the Magic Kingdom used to stay open until midnight, 1 a.m., 2 a.m., 3 a.m., 4 a.m. even. I have, yeah, I have a... Big Thunder Mountain Railroad Fast Pass on the on my wall in my studio for 4 a.m. Now that park closes early for special events, of course. They used to do nighttime electrical parades every night at the Magic Kingdom. Sometimes they ran it twice. We haven't had a nighttime parade in forever. They, you know, you think about all of the stuff that they have removed from the parks that just used to be part and parcel of, hey, I'm at Disney World. This is amazing. Look what they do. And now all of that is just reduced. It's, uh, I don't know, Disney World has turned into the Kmart version of themselves. So hopefully that'll get fixed. Slade Wilson says, how much influence will Pelts have over the direction that Disney takes once he gets his board seats? And I would say the biggest influence he'll have is in helping select the next CEO. Mm. Panel, what say mm. you as we wrap up these cues from you? Lorena, go ahead. Uh the only thing I can think of really is is most likely the CEO. That's the most powerful move that he has to make. The CEO is the face of the company. It's what, you know, Joe Q shareholder knows. And that's probably the first thing that he's going to go for, the first act. Get a CEO in there who isn't afraid to make the hard decisions. That is more about making Disney a profitable company as opposed to sucking up to the Hollywood and the government elites. Yeah. I would I would love to see Nelson Peltz successful in getting uh, Ike Perlmutter on the board only because I think Ooh. Bob Iger would double over. I think it would be yeah. worse than the time he was <laughs> refused by the hippo. I was, that, I was that's just, not as far fetched as you think it might be. I mean, Pearl Mutter and and Pelts are obviously good friends. Uh, I think it's it's very doable. I think the one thing that people are missing, I think Pelts's greatest influence in terms of the board itself is going to be how he can alter the public influence and the public perception. Right now, Disney, we all know, has a puppet board. They have a puppet board that was, they were all basically hand selected by Bob Iger. And people ask me, I don't get it. What do you mean? The, the Iger has to answer to the board. The board doesn't answer to Iger unless you're Bob Iger and you put mm. everybody on that board to begin with. Um, that's how this works. If y'all don't understand that that can happen and it does happen quite frequently in Fortune 500 companies, that is the reality. The difference is if you have Pelts and one or two other people from Pelts's cabal on that board. They're not just going to be checkmark yes men for Bob Iger. Um, and they're also not going to do the Disney thing like Bob Iger said. Like when Chapek was F-bombing Bob Iger on the plane ride back, couldn't stand working with him because Bob Iger was up his butt the whole time. Look, this is the problem. 
a guy like Iger is not going to sit there and be quiet, or excuse me, a guy like Peltz is not going to sit there and be quiet. Peltz is Peltz is going to make a statement. Now he's not going to divulge any classified inside business information that he cannot otherwise divulge. His lawyers are going to screen everything first, but he will he will come out and clearly say, you know, that they decided to do this. I want everybody to know out there that this was not the position of Tryan. We we fought against this. We don't want this. That's the kind of guy Peltz is, and I think that above anything else is what has that Disney board and Bob Iger especially PP in their cornflakes in their pants at the same time. I mean, this is this is not a good thing for them. Well, you know, if dropping sixty percent of their total company's value in two years won't scare them, then maybe Pelts will. Who knows? Go I ahead, would, Tommy. I, I would just say too that um, I would see that. Well, I think probably his biggest influence would be channeling Perlmutter. You know, the entire sort of Perlmutter philosophy of <clears throat> will this make money? Um, you know, I don't care what it is. I don't care what checkboxes it, it hits. Will it make money or not? And I think that sort of very hardline, basic philosophy, uh, or, or or at least sort of mantra, is what Disney needs at the moment. So it's almost like they're they're scared to take the medicine that that will heal them <laughs> in a way. You know, like I'd say it's business one hundred and one, but it's more simple than that, folks. One last reminder, that's the chart that shows you the blue line is South Park, the red line is the Marvels. Internet searches, it's showing you that this is like if uh, somebody put out a song and Weird Al parodied them, parodied them and his <laughs> parody was eight times more popular. It's like if Star Wars came out and Spaceballs was eight times more popular. This is the satire sitting atop the subject matter by eight times over so uh, that's the problem that Disney has. Their strategy, it sucks. All right, folks, make sure to check out Lorena Creole, Valiant Renegade, and Tommy Tables. The links for their channels are in the video description down below. Click on them and subscribe. You'll love what they do, and you need to dive into it right now. Also, before you head out, make sure that you like, share, subscribe. And when you click it, you stick it to the algorithms. It's the notification bell. Drop a comment down below. This is not just a conversation between four people, but no. This is for the entire community of which you are a part. So let us know what's on your mind. We covet your comments. We care about what you think and wherever you are and whatever you're doing. Keep learning, keep growing, and keep having fun. This Halloween's definitely going to be something. Even after dead franchises like Marvel are like zombies, rotting corpses of their former glory. Dead, but still animated. I wonder, mm. are there any franchises with some afterlife qualities? <laughs> One Piece is almost vampiric, as it's uh, mm. sucking the life out of the competition. <laughs> yeah. oh, oh. DC is kind of like Frankenstein's monster, with bits and pieces from everywhere, and nothing is consistent. I'm the ghost of Star Wars. <laughs> you know what would be a real treat this Halloween? Checking out WDW Pro. He's got all the sweet news on his Thursday live show at 5 p.m. Eastern. Not to mention, his daily videos are a real treat. Guys, <laughs> guys, I'm the ghost of Star Wars. Get it? You know, we should go and make sure we're subscribed. Guys, guys. I'm the ghost of Star Wars. And while we're at it, we'll ring that bell to make sure we're notified. Great. Let's go. Because, uh, well, we actually care about that. Let's go. Mm. Fact. Star Wars is not dead. It's haunting the staffs of Disney+. Plus. <laughs>